Well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker uh, for today's colloquium, Diva Caramaya. Many of you know him. He's an astrophysicist at the Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica, Optica y Electronica in Aoi, Puebla. Uh, from what I know, he works in many fields. Some of them are globular clusters, H2 regions, stellar population, galaxies, local and extragalactic star formation, world rayet stars. And today he's going to talk about his recent work related to the world riot phenomenon. I will let him in, uh, present the title. Uh, Divakara, thank you for accepting our invitation whenever you want to start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. So share the screen to start with. Okay, hope you can see the screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Sundar and Vicente uh, for, uh, for letting me speak about my recent work. So that's uh, going to be on uh, the ionization of uh, helium plus uh, in general. And in particular, I'll be talking about the observations, uh, results that we have got from observations with the Megara at the GTC on uh, specific on the central region of the irregular galaxy NGC 1569, which you are seeing in the background of this image. I'll, explain more detail uh, soon. So this work uh, was done in a collaboration with the, uh, the, the Megara scientific group and the instrumentation group. So, and it's based on uh, a paper which uh, got accepted recently, actually from today onwards, it's available, oh, sorry, uh, available uh, in the monthly notes website with the volume number. So it will be appearing on the October issue. So this, uh, 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 work, as I said, is based on the, uh, on the Megara, which was com commissioned at the telescope uh, three years ago. So the Megara instrument uh, is, uh, the, is, is under the supervision of, uh, was constructed under the supervision of Armando Hilde Pass in Madrid, and uh, its optical components are designed and fabricated in, in Hawaii under the supervision of Esperanza Carrasco. So we have, uh, uh, as um, uh, collaborators, uh, uh, you know, various people from the instrumentation group from different institutes. And also we have from IRIA, um, uh, Mauricio Gomez Gonzalez and uh, Gustavo Bresual in this group. Well, uh, let me introduce you to the problem. Well, uh, helium, as you know, it is the second most abundant element and the second element in the periodic table and the simplest, second simplest element to model theoretically, but uh, it's surprising that we still have many scientific problems uh, regarding the ionization of helium plus, that is to take its, both its electrons. Yeah. So uh, the problem arises mainly because it has a very high ionization energy of 54.4 electron volts uh, uh, so that we can take both the electrons from the helium. So as, uh, can we see, uh, as you can see in the uh, uh, HR diagram in uh, here, so main sequence stars do not have this kind of uh, energies. So you need to have uh, 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 stellar temperatures of at least 60,000 Kelvin so that you can provide enough photons, uh, long word, uh, short word of uh, 228 angstrom, which is a cutoff uh, wavelength uh, uh, so that uh, helium can be doubly ionized. So, however, as uh, massive stars evolve uh, in around three million years, the most massive stars go into a phase called as uh, the wolf ray stars. So this, uh, during this phase, uh, the temperature uh, goes uh, uh, beyond this uh, limit and it provides the energy photon necessary to doubly ionize helium. So basically in this uh, chart diagram, in this, uh, column, uh, in this uh, chart diagram, you can see the, the blue hatched region is the range of uh, temperature that can ionize uh, helium twice. So the wolf ray stars can provide such a uh, energy and generally wolf ray stars at solar metals need to have a mass of at least 25 solar masses. And uh, that will happen around three to Five million years during its uh, uh, its, uh, its lifetime. So, uh, 
So uh, here or to the right, I'm showing the spectral energy distribution that uh, corresponds to a main sequence star of 40,000 Kelvin. Just to illustrate that at these temperatures, so you have almost no photons of capable of ionizing helium twice. So although you have enough photons for ionizing hydrogen and helium uh, once. I have some problem moving the cursor, so sorry. So, well, so what you saw earlier was the evolution of a single star. So, but uh, I'm interested here in a galaxy. So in a galaxy, any region will have stars, uh, actually star clusters, not one star. So you have agglomeration of stars. So, uh, so I'm showing here the expected spectra, theoretical spectra, of one such star forming region. So these uh, graphs are taken from Starburst 99, because they're told to 99. So here, uh, uh, what we plotted is the spectral energy distribution uh, for uh, Starburst uh, for different, at, at different ages, you know, at solar metallicity. So as you can see, only between three and five million years, uh, you have enough of uh, photons to doubly ionize helium. So that means you can expect the helium uh, lines, WNS helium lines, only when the wool phase appear in a cluster. So, uh, however, if you evolve uh, stars at, uh, uh, at different metallicities, you see that at metallicities of uh, only around uh, uh, metallicity of uh, one, around 5% of solar, so you don't have any ionizing photons for helium, so you can't, uh, you don't expect this uh, uh, ionization of helium at low metallicities. So, so that is, so in, the, in such a case, so you can't uh, have in metal poor galaxies, the helium line. So, however, the reality is very different. So, this is the one Suti 18, one of the most metal poor galaxies. So here is the, uh, the observations of uh, this galaxy using again IFU uh, by Kerry et al. What they found is that, well, this galaxy has uh, two uh, bright star forming nodes. One is the Southeast one here, I hope you can see my cursor. So on the other one is the Northwest. So in the Northwest star forming node, uh, they have detected the helium uh, transitions, this heli WINS to helium transition, basically the helium 24686 angstrom line in the blue region of the spectrum. Uh, the, uh, the intensity of this helium line corresponds to around 10 to the power 50 photons per second uh, uh, of uh, helium ionizing photons. They also found that the region has around nine wolf stars of carbon type. So, but the required ionization is around 500 stars. You require 500 wolf stars. So, whereas what's, it, uh, what's observed is only around nine wolf stars. So, the, 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 the observed number is around 150th of what is required. So, then the biggest qu the big question is what is the source of ionization? for the helium in this galaxy. Well, it turns out that uh, one suki 18 is uh, not alone in having this problem. Actually, uh, all low metallicity galaxies have this problem. So here I'm showing two plots, one from a study of Platt et al. That's a group of Gustavo Bruswell and another one in the Scherer. So both uh, uh, studies from last year. So where I'm plotting the strength of the helium line with respect to H beta uh, with, uh, with respect to the metallicity of the gas. Uh, in both the studies, you can see a trend for increasing uh, strength of the helium as the metallicity decreases, you know, just uh, opposite to the trend that we have seen from uh, popular synthesis models. Uh, so this problem is uh, popularly known as the ionization budget problem at low metallicity. So metal poor galaxies are not expected to have 
uh, this line of helium, but uh, in reality, you, you have uh, uh, this line and it is uh, uh, brighter as compared to at uh, solar metallicities, for example. So what Scharer has done here is to try to explain this tendency and they found that the, the X-ray uh, flux also increases in low metallicity galaxies. So they postulated that if X-ray uh, emission is coming from high mass X-ray binaries, then uh, at low metallicity, it uh, seems like there are more high mass X-ray binaries. So the ionization is not from uh, wolf ray stars, but instead from high mass X-ray binaries. So that's a proposition. It is still not modeled completely from the uh, from using a popular synthesis models, actually. So uh, the different lines here is basically uh, uh, the empirical models they, they suggested, which, uh, which uses the X-ray flux from the high mass X-ray binaries to explain the ionization of helium. Okay, so the, the models that I showed you earlier, the evolutionary models, uh, where uh, simple evolutionary models, for instance, they are uh, not taking into account uh, the processes that we know happen in massive stars. One of them is the rotation. So stars rotate, and especially high mass stars rotate faster. So how does it affect the, the helium ionizing photons? So in this study of Leiter et al., I am showing the, the differences between uh, the, the, the evolution of uh, this helium line. Here, uh, equivalent width of helium is shown. Uh, with and without rotation. The red line you see with rotation at solar metallicity, yes, there is some, um, uh, some prolongation of the period for which uh, helium can be seen in a star forming region. Uh, whereas at subsolar metallicity, there's no such trend. So rotation cannot explain the helium budget problem that uh, I discussed. Here. So, well, also, we know that binaries exist. In fact, more than 50% of the uh, uh, high mass stars, or massive stars, are expected to be in binaries. So uh, these uh, models, uh, B-pass models from Eldridge et al., uh, take into account the binaries. And when you have binaries, especially at low metallicities, you again get a prolonged uh, period of uh, uh, high energy photons. So this, uh, well, there are several curves, so we can for now ignore uh, all these curves, but the main uh, point from this uh, graph that you can take is that at uh, low metal states, uh, there is an increasing uh, number of binaries and uh, the, the presence of binaries uh, extends the period for which uh, high energy photons are available. So you can get even up to around 50 or 20 million years uh, ionizing photon flux when there, are, there is binary. So I will uh, compare the results of these uh, models later on in my, in my study, in my talk. Okay, so another way of uh, finding out the, or resolving this issue is observing uh, uh, in detail uh, regions or wolf ray regions or wherever regions are there with the helium emission uh, by morphologically resolving them. So unfortunately, I mean, in nearby galaxies, in our galaxy or in the nearby galaxies, but unfortunately in the Milky Way, I couldn't find uh, uh, really um, many studies of uh, uh, such nebulae. So uh, possibly the, the main re reason for the absence of uh, the, the, the images in this uh, helium two line is that it is, uh, it's around 1% of the H beta line and to get images in this filter is somewhat uh, difficult, especially because you have to subtract the continuum and the continuous subtraction errors uh, will make the uh, confiability of the, uh, of the emission uh, difficult. So that's the reason why there are no, uh, that many objects with the, this kind of uh, images. So I could find in the LMC, uh, the most uh, famous ones are uh, N79 in the LMC and N76 in the SMC. So, well, now with the availability of many EFOO-driven instruments, this will change uh, in, in future, no? uh, as I have illustrated with uh, our study of the NGC 1569. Well, uh, here I'm comparing basically the HRF morphology with the 
expected helium morphology from uh, an aging star. So uh, to the right, I have a simple cartoon of the Strongland sphere where uh, helium is uh, expected in the, in the very interior radius, in a smaller radius as compared to hydrogen, which will occupy the entire ionized uh, gas volume. Whereas single ionized helium will occupy a radius somewhat intermediate. So as you can see in both the nebulae here, the tendency is similar. So you have a, a H alpha nebulae, which is basically the entire nebula, and only the central part of it, you can see uh, enhancement of the helium line. So, uh, so this is, uh, here it looks uh, simple, but we know that ultra stars have a lot of winds and that will change this picture. So when the wind is there, the winds uh, uh, evacuate the central zone, zone very close to the star and the picture may be different. So. Okay, another galaxy where some study is available for this uh, helium is in M33. So in M33, Kerry uh, uh, et al. Uh, obtained an image of uh, uh, in the helium line and they obtained eight regions of helium to emission. So, but they could confirm only three regions spectroscopically as helium emitting regions. So out of it, they find that the MA1 um, which has a WNE central star is uh, uh, well, well explained, uh, or rather its ionization is well explained as due to its central star, which is WNE star, no, ultra star. So however, in the other two cases, the last two in the table, so there is no obvious uh, hot star. So uh, they couldn't explain the source of ionization. So even in the nearby universe, uh, so we have regions where we can't completely understand the ionization of uh, uh, helium. You know? So that's what uh, I want to take from this. Well, so now we can uh, uh, concentrate on our study. So with this background, so we uh, propose to observe NGC 1569. So its central region has two uh, massive clusters, clusters A and B. In fact, uh, and one of them is young, A he has uh, uh, around five million years of age, and B is around 15 million years of age. So uh, in fact, they are uh, the nearest examples for massive young clusters. So you have massive globular clusters in the Milky Way and in other galaxies, but uh, uh, massive young clusters of this mass of almost uh, uh, one million solar masses of mass. So uh, this is the nearest of such clusters. At a distance, uh, this, this is at a distance of 3.1 megaparsec, and this galaxy has a metallicity which is similar to the LMC. So, and from this image, which is the HST image, and the red uh, filaments that you see is the chalfa filaments. So you can already see that a lot of ionized gas um, uh, around the around the cluster A. So, so we uh, observed the the central region to know the whether this cluster, this uh, ionized gas is also associated with ionized uh, helium, showing, uh, I mean, in, in helium, doubly ionized helium. So both of these clusters are very compact. They are actually superstellar cluster with a typical radius of, uh, half light radius of uh, around three parsec. And uh, they are well studied. They have actually virial masses also. So the dynamically stable systems, the cluster A has uh, I mean, wolf ray stars, whereas cluster B has no wolf ray stars. So we know that there are ionizing sources. So that's why we uh, propose to observe this region to uh, trying to uh, look for the uh, helium line. So as I said, the main proposal is to look for the helium line and see whether there is any uh, budget problem for this galaxy. Well, we use the Megara, as I mentioned. So the Megara instrument has two modes of observation. One is the EFU mode, where you can get spectra over a region of around 12.5 uh, into 11.3 arc second in every pixel. So, but as it has other mode of observation, mode where we can cover a larger area, but uh, at selected uh, positions, around 92 positions, you can you can observe. In the EFU mode, so you have also uh, I mean, uh, the fibers that take care of the sky spectra. Actually, this uh, 
the brown uh, uh, hexagons uh, that you see in the edge of this moss field, they are the ones where the sky fibers are uh, placed and that helps to subtract the sky emission you know, from the IFU field of view. So, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, Megara comes with uh, uh, at three resolutions. So the low weight resolution 6,000 where you can resolve lines of around one angstrom's uh, width. And it also has 12,000 and 18,000 uh, uh, spectral resolutions. So uh, for our observations, we use the blue region of the spectrum, uh, the, which, is, which is basically this is the, the grating or uh, VPH that we have used. So uh, in the highest resolution mode, uh, it's available basically for the H alpha and calcium triplet lines at the zero redshift. Okay, so the observations carried out uh, early last year. So uh, as I said, in the LRB setup, uh, which was basically one hour uh, observations. So we uh, did the observation, the IFU mode covering this uh, uh, zone shown in the, in the red square, basically. So the sky conditions are dark, and these observations are part of the guaranteed time observations because the, the it's uh, uh, for the for the work uh, instrumental work carried out. So uh, the the Megara group has uh, uh, time available uh, for carrying out specific science projects, and this is one of such projects. Megara has its own pipeline. The data reduction pipeline uh, gives uh, as uh, wavelength and flux calibrated uh, spectra, uh, which are also sky subtracted and uh, the spectra is uh, presented as a 2D spectral image. So we developed our own programs uh, in Python and IRAF uh, to further process the images and get the line fluxes and also make images. So, so this is basically the output of, from the Megara data reduction pipeline. So you get the 2D spectra. So here we have on the x-axis, wavelength increasing from the edge gamma line here on the, on the left side. Whereas on the right side extreme, so you have the oxygen three line, H beta line is here. And we are looking basically for the uh, helium two forty six eighty six line. So which is this line, which uh, uh, spreads over the, uh, all, all, the, all the fibers. So fiber numbers go from one and on the, uh, at the bottom to 623 at the top. Yeah? And we know the positions of uh, all these fibers, each fiber, so we can construct images using this. So on the bottom, what you have is just a cut over the, any one of these uh, fiber spectra. So this is the complete image uh, collapsing the spectra into uh, one, uh, in, into each pixels. And here the Megara pixels are of hexagonal shape. So you can uh, see that uh, uh, here red means uh, high intensity and uh, white means low intensity. So most of the flux is detected in this uh, uh, the cluster A and cluster B. And also uh, the, the, the fibers are bundled into uh, seven uh, uh, fibers together. Uh, so, and these seven fibers come from different uh, areas in this uh, field of view. And there is uh, some issue with the crosstalk. Actually, what you see here and here, uh, they are part of this cluster A, but th these fibers are close to the fi one of the fibers belonging to the cluster A. So we have taken into care of this, uh, this crosstalks. And uh, so these signals uh, doesn't mean that they are coming from this place. Instead, they are associated with this. So having this uh, map, we understand exactly the instrument and we can take care of these issues. So uh, to the right, you have uh, the H beta uh, image, which is in hexagonal pixels. So created from these spectra. So uh, whereas uh, in the bottom, you have the same image, now smooth to represent the seeing of the image, which is around one arc second. So uh, I here show uh, such uh, plots for several lines. You have the H beta line, uh, same as I showed earlier, and the H gamma line. With combining the H beta and the H gamma lines, we can create an extinction map, uh, which is uh, here. And uh, also, we can create the helium 4686 uh, uh, map, as well as the Ulfre maps. Sorry, uh, I, I yeah. believe uh, Elsa has a question. 
So yeah, uh, go ahead. I can see the questions here. Okay. Please oh, go uh, ahead. Maybe she raised her hand by mistake. Okay. We can... Okay. Sorry. Continue. Okay. Uh, so, so what you see here basically uh, is the, the 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 capacity of the instrument. So we can create uh, in any of the lines or any of the continuum bands such images, and we can analyze the uh, the these structures uh, more quantitatively. So, uh, so this uh, the last image here is the B-band image, which is uh, created by by uh, by integrating the spectra over the the response filter of the B band image. Yeah. So, which compares very well with the HST image of this, this uh, cluster in the color that you can see here. Yeah. So, so, basically, this is the data set. So, we'll be using this uh, data and I will be uh, explaining uh, the morphology of the helium uh, nebula, which you can see here. I'll uh, talk more in detail as I go along. So alternatively, we can also uh, analyze the spectrum of any region by, by pixel by pixel or integrate over uh, any like the circular regions. So as an illustration, I show you three spectra, uh, spectra of uh, the cluster A. So this cluster, as I mentioned in introduction, so is uh, is a known source of Wolf-Ray stars. So you can see the Wolf-Ray broad bump here. Whereas cluster B does not have any wolf ray stars. You can see a continuum bright region with some nebular emission uh, here. Whereas in a region where we know that there was a nebula, you can see that uh, its spectrum is uh, dominated by ne uh, typical nebular lines. Okay, so, well, how do you detect the wolf ray stars? Well, wolf ray stars are, uh, show their characteristic features in the blue and uh, uh, the red regions of the spectrum, so the, which are called as blue bump, which occur at uh, exactly where the helium line, nebula line occurs, and red bump, which is at, at 58, 10 angstroms. So in the mega observations we have taken, we don't have the red bump, so we only have the blue bump. So by analyzing the, these bumps, so we can know uh, which kind of full free stars are there, whether they are nitrogen rich or they are carbon rich. So here the spectra I'm showing from our own study with the Mauricio study uh, in, in M81. So uh, where we have detected the wolf rays, uh, single wolf ray stars in this galaxy of uh, nitrogen type in the top part and the carbon type in the, in the bottom part. So nitrogen type only have the blue bump, whereas the WC type have blue and red bumps. So analyzing with the, uh, with, the, with the procedure that I'll explain uh, here uh, uh, soon. So we can exactly know what are the ions giving rise to these bombs, you know, whether they are coming from carbon lines or nitrogen lines or helium lines. So deep, based on that, we can classify uh, just by looking at the blue bump, whether they are uh, wolf stars of WC type or WN type. So, so if we if you see the broad line, it means you have wolf ray stars, and measuring the strength of that line, we can estimate uh, how many stars contribute to the, the uh, to that strength. Okay. Well, what we did was to uh, analyze using multi Gaussian uh, fitting routines um, because the nebular line and the broad line uh, from the wolf ray occur at the same wavelength. You no, know, as you can uh, you can see here in the left illustrations. So this is the uh, spectrum of uh, one of the fibers associated with, with the, the cluster A. So the uh, fiber number 416. So where you can see uh, the narrow feature, which is uh, giving the, the, uh, the core of this line uh, intensity, whereas you have a broad line underlying. No? So the multi Gaussian fitting routine is able to isolate and measure the fluxes in the broad component as well as the narrow component. So here is a, another example where we have only the broad component and a uh, third example uh, where we have only the nebular component. So uh, we, we carried out this kind of uh, automatic uh, or semi-automatic fittings uh, for all the uh, 567 fibers. So 
and we found that in 49 fibers we have a component which requires a broader than uh, full width function broader than six angstrom so that is associated with the wolf ray whereas uh, well 18 of them belong to the cluster a uh, whereas there are more than 250 fibers have a, a narrow component which is coming from the nebula the broad component is uh, in our case in all cases it was helium lines we didn't see carbon lines and either nitrogen lines so which is a characteristic of uh, stars of dublin late type so uh, so uh, so the stars we detect in uh, this is WNL type, and the previous reports are consistent with this uh, uh, classification of the stars. So we uh, use this uh, fluxes that we obtain from this decomposition uh, to create uh, maps in these two lines. The maps I showed you earlier exactly uh, were coming from this uh, uh, analysis. Okay, here I show uh, the positions of these uh, 49 fibers where we suspected the presence of wolf ray stars. However, it turns out that uh, um, uh, the main uh, emission, emitting spot is the cluster A, and rest of the uh, emission comes from uh, uh, fibers that are associated with the, the fibers of cluster A because of the crosstalk, or where the emission is just marginal. So, so as a conclusion, so the map I showed you earlier, the black and white uh, map, where you can see that uh, most of the emission comes from the, the cluster A, so which is uh, here shown, and in, in, uh, uh, the, the footprint of the individual fibers are shown in the left diagram. So, uh, well, here uh, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, determining, so, what is the number of uh, wolf ray stars uh, in, in cluster A, uh, basically. So the cluster A is the, the, the zone marked by hatches here to the right side of this diagram. So where in each of these fibers, we get more than one wolf ray. So the number of wolf rays are calculated just by dividing the typical flux of a, a wolf ray WNL type star, which is 1.2 10 to the power 36 arcs per second. So uh, in total, from this, we get around 124 wolf ray stars. Well, there is uh, uncertainty because of uh, the, the extinction corrections. So we have the extinction map, which we'll show you uh, uh, soon, but the extinction map we have is for the nebula region. So uh, the cluster A sits in a region where there is not much nebular gas, and we don't know exactly what is the extinction. So actually, this is one of the galaxies where there's a large, uh, the, the, the foreground extinction from the galactic dust, so which gives it around 1.6 magnitude. So that is the minimum extinction at any place. But uh, the galaxy also seems to have a lot of internal extinction. So uh, previous studies uh, have estimated like 2.3 magnitude as the typical extinction for the cluster A. So that gives it around 124 wolf ray stars. However, our mean nebular extinction is 2.65 um, magnitudes. So which would, uh, I mean, if the cluster also suffers that extinction, would have more than 186 uh, uh, wolf ray stars in this, in this region. So these numbers are agreement with that reported by Gonzalez Delgado using long cleat spectra of cluster A. So after taking into account the, the different distances used in that early work and this, this work. Okay. so. Uh, well, this uh, region also had other sources. So a few sources where it's already known that there are no wolf ray stars. We are uh, here again analyzing them. And other sources which have been proposed as possible uh, wolf ray sources based on uh, HST images in this narrow band filter uh, centered on the helium line. So, uh, but we found that this uh, narrow band emission uh, is coming from the uh, coming from the narrow lines, not wolf ray lines. And uh, the only source where we can uh, confidently say that we have detected wolf rays is cluster A. No, all the other sources uh, do not have uh, this, uh, this wolf rays. No, cluster B also you can see doesn't have any uh, wolf ray stars in the spectra as it was known. Okay, so now here I am plotting the, 
the the image in the nebular line in the helium nebular line so which is uh, following a crescent shaped structure uh, which uh, on the background in the red you can see the h alpha image so which closely follows the h alpha image and the characteristic of this uh, uh, the shape is that close to the star we don't have uh, any any nebular gas so at least there is a 40 parts nearest uh, nebular emitting region is a 40 parsec from the cluster a whereas the overall uh, uh, diameter of this uh, arc semicircular arc is around 150 parsec so it's a very big uh, region of ionized gas and uh, we detect helium almost in all the zone where h alpha is detected so the as you can see in this image the the this uh, well uh, this bubble so this uh, evacuated region is not centered in the in the in, uh, in, in the cluster a so it may suggest some density gradients in the region so, uh, so and this uh, uh, this empty region also suggests that the the wolf ray uh, or the, the high winds that uh, that are coming from more than 100 wolf ray stars are responsible for creating this uh, this bubble no? so what we are seeing here is basically a, a gigantic wolf ray bubble no? of, of 160 par 150 parsec uh, diameter okay so this is another image of the same uh, region uh, where now uh, it's a com combination of the uh, h beta uh, helium 2 and h gamma lines so where the we mark uh, i mean showed in the uh, contours the extinctions the highest extinction regions are shown in red so this is basically where the intensity of the hydrogen and uh, helium lines also the maximum so extinction also is maximum in the same region and uh, overall you have uh, extinction uh, more than 1.6 magnitude as the galactic extinction in this part of the uh, nebula now you can see the the evacuated central region around this cluster in the in this part of this uh, image okay so now having obtained these images so we made some cal uh, quantitative uh, calculations of the 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 uh, ionizing photon rates required you know, this is uh, just following the well uh, uh, standard photoionization recombination calculations of post Robert and Ferland. So the, the photon ionization rate for the helium plus uh, is uh, can be derived just by looking at the intensity of the uh, 4686 helium line. Same way as we do um, uh, from the deriving the Lyman continuum photons using the H beta line. So that gives us around uh, 10 to the 52 photons per second of hydrogen ionizing photons, uh, whereas uh, around uh, uh, 10 to the 50 photons per second for the helium uh, WNS photons. You know? So uh, the, the detected strength, uh, I'm talking about here global emissions. So detected global ratio of the helium to hydrogen lines around 2% and uh, uh, equivalent weight depending on the the, the extinction uh, assumption that you make, it can vary between 75 to 160 angstroms globally for this region. So we, we compare these values with the, all the uh, up-to-date uh, uh, stellar population models. So we used several of them. So uh, the Starburst 99 using the Padova and you know, uh, evolutionary uh, models and uh, uh, the the pop star models from Moya et al., uh, Bruce Wall and Charlotte 2003, and the most recent one also, and these uh, um, B pass models with that uh, involve binaries from the Eldridge. So these uh, cover most of the um, uh, options that are available in the literature right now in terms of developments in the evolutionary models as well as in the atmospheres of the wolf ray stars. In all cases, uh, we use the Krupa IMF between 0 0.15 to 100 solar masses. So the results are shown here. So, uh, well, this is uh, in the left plot. What I am showing here is the 
ratio of the hydrogen uh, helium to hydrogen line, the beta line. So in the log units, where the observed value is uh, here in the horizontal portion. Uh, same way, the number of wolf rays that are detected is around 124, but depending on the extinction, it can be around 56 to 186. Uh, so it has a large range in this case. And the number of hydrogen adding photons, which is around 52 ags per second. So we are here trying to see what mass we require and what uh, uh, ages we can explain all these three observed quantities. And it turns out that. Uh, I mean, you can, the, the, the diagram is clumsy because we have plotted all the uh, available evolutionary models and only three evolutionary models can explain all, the, all these three uh, uh, combinations simultaneously. So there are the Starburst 19N models using the Padova tracks or the Popstar models using Padova tracks or the BC03 uh, models using the Padova tracks. Now, basically those, uh, uh, SSP models that use Padova tracks are able to explain values of uh, helium to hydrogen line greater than 1% uh, of the emission. So others have uh, pretty two less number of helium ionizing photons. So uh, whereas uh, the, I mean, the same models also explain the observed number of uh, wolf ray stars at an age around uh, 4 million years. And all the models explain the observed number of uh, uh, hydrogen ionizing photons for a mass of 5.5 to 5 solar masses. And this mass is consistent with the uh, earlier estimates of mass for these regions. And even the age of 4 million years is the age explained, uh, age obtained from the color magnitude diagrams of the stars in the cluster A in the periphery. You know? so, so, this, uh, in all, so this, uh, we can explain completely the, the emission of helium as uh, an addition as from the 124 ultra stars you know, using the, the Padova models. You know? Whereas in the, uh, uh, in the, using the Geneva and other models, actually Geneva model is very interesting. It produces, overproduces a number of ultra stars, but for the same models, we have uh, less number of helium ionizing photons. So, so I'll illustrate the metal is dependent in the next graph. So uh, not understand further this uh, aspect I'm plotting here uh, to the left, on uh, the left, the, the, the spectral energy distributions in the region uh, shortward of 228 angstroms. So all the spectra are normalized to their uh, Lyman continuum photon strength. So here the differences basically are, uh, in, in, in indicate the different strengths of the helium to hydrogen line. So Again, only those models that have uh, uh, that have Padova evolutionary tracks can explain the uh, uh, I mean high observed ratios of helium to uh, uh, hydrogen. Yeah. But uh, at lower metallicity, especially metallicity below Z is equal to 004, that's around one fifth of solar metallicity, and all the models um, have a drop there. And you don't have enough hydrogen and any photons, uh, helium and any photons, sorry. And uh, the model that has uh, a maximum number of helium and any photons is basically the ones involving binaries. So these are the BPOS models. So the same is illustrated in the right diagram here, which is the helium to hydrogen uh, fluxes against the metallicities. So the observed ratio for 1569, which is around one third of solar metallicity is here. So at this metallicity, these three models can explain the observed values. And at lower metallicity, you can see all these models uh, drop drastically, whereas we know that there exist low met uh, metallicity galaxies with uh, ratios in excess of 1% of this ratio of this observation, observable quantity. Uh, in the BPOS models, uh, have especially those include binaries. So how this right tendency, they have uh, increasing uh, number of uh, this ratio at lower metallicities. However, what's uh, worrying is that they, their values for the solar metallicity are find very, very low as compared to the other models. So, so that's the, uh, I mean, so the binary models help, but uh, 
they produce at very uh, at solar metallicity values which are less than what is normally observed. Okay, so uh, as a final, um, uh, as a as a final uh, issue on this uh, object, so I sh here show the X-ray emission. So uh, in the introduction, I saw that uh, I discussed that the X-ray emission also can, or X-ray emitting objects also can explain the helium ionization. So for NGC 1569, there exist the X-ray maps actually using the uh, Monica Sanchez study. So uh, this uh, blue image is the X-ray map uh, and also the white contours just illustrate the X-ray emission. And most of the X-ray emission comes from two, uh, two point sources, which, is, which are named as X27 and X33. So these are, this one is uh, X-ray binary, a uh, compact object there, whereas this uh, X33 is a star cluster. So, uh, this is much, uh, it's a star cluster of much lower mass compared to cluster A, but it has a higher emission. Probably there are some binaries in this star cluster. So, but the cluster A itself is not a uh, bright source of uh, X-rays. And in the zone where we have the helium emission, so there is faint uh, diffuse uh, soft X-ray emission, but the flux is not sufficient to explain the oxidation of helium and its morphology also is not what is seen in the helium line. So we we discard the, uh, any uh, serious contribution of uh, X-rays in the ionization of helium in this in this object. As I already illustrated, the most of the ionization comes from the, I mean hundred percent ionization comes from the wolf ray stars uh, that are there in the cluster A. So. Uh, so that's the, all I wanted to talk. So I, I give a summary here. So uh, we carried out the NGC 1516 observations using the Megara. So hopefully this illustrates what can be done as Megara is a new instrument, probably it will motivate others also to uh, use uh, uh, Megara for similar or uh, uh, comparable kind of studies. So we have detected uh, helium-2-4686 nebular emission uh, over an extended region which has an arc shaped structure and uh, it is uh, uh, around the cluster A. And the entire ionization can be explained by 124 Wolf ray stars that are coming, that are uh, there in the cluster A. And the parameters for the cluster A that we derive, its age and mass, are consistent with what is already uh, known uh, for this cluster. And hence, at least at this metallicity in this galaxy, we don't see. Uh, the, the ionization budget problems. And so uh, the, we need to carry out such studies at even lower metallicity of nearby objects and try to address this problem. Thank you. That's all I want to talk. Thank you very much. So, um, we have time for a few questions, but I just want to mention when we're done with the question session, uh, Renee has an announcement. Okay, so let's see some raised hands. Ah, okay. Uh, Jesus, go ahead. Hello, Divakara. Very nice results. Very beautifully captured, extracted everything. I just have a question on the models. So you said that the, the best that reproduces the observations is the Padova ones. If you go to two slides before this one, for example, that one. This so one? that's the Padova. Yes. So you say that the Padova magenta line is reproducing what you observe, right? Uh, exactly. So my question is about, so does this model, it's only single stars? Is yes, they are okay. single star models, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. This is a combination of Padova and the, uh, in this, most of them have used the CF, uh, CF gen models. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. CF gen models, okay. Yeah, because with a very short age, I would expect binaries to dominate at that time, right? Exactly. It's, That's one of the problems with the binary. So I had four million years to have a lot of binaries, not easy. So, yeah. so now my next question is if you go back again. So we are recently bombarded by this deep pass modeling that is one of the best. And still the single <laughs> scenario is very low. Like, why do you think is this? Like, exactly. I'm surprised when I did this comparison. 
So it produces very less number of helium ionizing photons. So it's uh, it's very below in this uh, at, low, at solar metal states. It doesn't produce even the helium singly ionized helium. So it stops. Binary models can produce. So there is some problem with the solar metals. I don't know exactly what is the situation with the big pass models. Yeah, I, um, maybe Mauricio can answer this, but how, how are the Wolfred stars in like taking into account in this EPAS modeling? Do you guys have any idea? Like, because th this seems to suggest that this model does not produce many Wolfred stars because you expect this ionization from the Wolfred stars. Yeah, so that uh, is, so answer is here basically. So it produces number of full stars. Probably, the problem is the um, problem is the atmospheres. Probably, I feel the power atmospheres. Mm. So at solar metal state, produces uh, quite a good strength here in this plot with the binary models. Okay. So the problem is the power, the, the Maybe, power um, stellar atmospheres. Yeah, I can't really bet on that because we need to do uh, <laughs> analysis. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's interesting that it doesn't produce that. I'm, I'm actually surprised because as you said, the power that, I mean, the BPAS models are supposed to be the best models. In fact, referee asked us to compare. In our earlier version, I didn't put the BPAS models. So he suggested that we should use BPAS models. That's <laughs> why I prepared this. <laughs> so, Turns out that doesn't ex explain everything that we see. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jesus. Uh, Jane? Yeah, um, my uh, question or comment is a continuation of what you've just been talking about. Um, so it's not necessarily the actual stellar evolution model, it's the atmosphere model. So if you use the BPAS models with the CMF gen instead of with power, then you might get a, a different result. Because my experience of looking at the CMF gen and the power um, so spectrum, SED, for a given wolf ray star is that, yes, power has far fewer um, energetic ionizing photons because they're all absorbed in the, in the wind, mm -hmm. whereas CMF gen has more for a, a given effective temperature. Okay. So I think there is a lot we don't really understand about modeling stars with strong stellar winds and whether there are gaps that let the, the photons out. Okay, thank you. So that's, that's uh, homework for you, actually. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> good. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, we have a question from Mauricio. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Divakara, a really nice talk. Uh, so for NGC 50, uh, 1569, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, the helium plus uh, ionization budget problem, but what do you think is the source of ionization for those uh, uh, objects at low metallicities that do have this problem? Well, uh, as suggested by uh, here by Cheryl, I think uh, the way to go is to, the way to go is to create high mass X-ray binaries at very young ages. One of the problems, as Sundar mentioned, uh, I mean, you can't create them uh, from zero age within four million years, enough number of these high mass X-ray binaries. So maybe we have continued, uh, I don't know, maybe the star formation continues for a longer period. Uh, so for example, in the cluster A, there is evidence for uh, some old stars, around uh, uh, 10 million years stars are also existing, although most of the flux, uh, what we see in the blue region comes from the N cluster, but there is uh, some stars, red supergiants. So maybe clusters have more than uh, one um, population of stars and you have enough time to prepare uh, the, the compact object necessary to form the, the high mass binaries. So the problem is you need to form first the compact objects so that you can have a high mass binary and emit their X-ray. No? So I think that's the way to go. So it's just starting. So Farrer here uh, empirically showed that you can 
do that, but uh, there is no theoretical calculus in it about establishing uh, this relation. So I think I will stop there. So it's uh, highly speculative right now. Thank you. Um, so uh, Rosa? Oh, yes, thank you for the talk, Diva. So maybe I didn't see a, an a, a figure right, but it seems that the more recent Charlot and Broussois models with Padova also do not reproduce yeah, the they, flux. Do we know why? Yeah, I don't know. Gustavo is uh, connected. So uh, yeah, that can show uh, you here. Uh, maybe because we are using the power models. In the exactly. That's the newer that's models. Idea. And the older models don't use the power models. Yeah. So it is just, so, it's the next fourth one in the list. Okay. The thing is, that newer, newer doesn't mean better. But we, yeah, yeah. For, for several things, it seems like the 2003 models were very, very good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, a matter of luck. Okay, it's, stoch it's stochastic. Yeah, but I don't know. It, it we are doing the best we can, but we cannot produce as many photons as before. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank it you. It is the same number of Ulfre stars as the other models. That is, that is uh, green, around 90 Ulfre stars it produces. So it must be the problem is with the atmosphere models again. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I think Jesus had a question. Yeah, it was about binaries uh, uh, on the X-ray binary. So do you expect them to be sources of this uh, extra ionization that you're lacking, right? But do you expect them to have them in a very early time in the galaxy evolution, right? Or... Uh... Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the problem I didn't, uh, yeah, I can go back to see, show the problem in detail. This, okay. So in this, the problem area is the, uh, oh, I don't have this high equivalent uh, plot. I don't have it. So uh, there are regions having very high equivalent width of uh, the H beta line, which suggests that the, clusters are really young, so younger than uh, 3 million years. So, uh, but they have high ratio of helium to hydrogen ions. So those are the most complicated to explain right now. So, so you can't, it, uh, the H beta flux or equivalent will suggest that the burst is really young. You know? so, so then how can you produce the absolute ratio? I mean, binary, there is not, enough time, not enough time to produce the binaries in such young systems. Well, if they're like 60 or 80 solar masses, they will evolve in less than, I don't know, one million years. Yeah, there was one suggestion by Kojima, I didn't put it here, of uh, having hyper mass stars, more than 300 solar mass. So they, if such stars exist in these metal core galaxies, so they can, collapse into a black hole much earlier because if the mass is about 300, they can collapse into black holes. So they're about the pair instability limit. So, so they can uh, uh, form binaries at around 2 million years. So which uh, gives enough time to produce uh, these binaries at an early age, no? But it's again speculative. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jesus. We have time for one question, if anyone has one. Okay, if not, let's thank the Vakra again.